If I can uh, convene us. I know we're, uh, we're actually a bit short on chairs. Uh, we, we have put out a, an SOS to get more chairs um, uh, for those of you, but uh, th there's still some spaces if uh, people can, uh, can shuffle in. I take it always as a, as a really good sign that uh, we're out of chairs. So it's a, it's a delight to have you all here. So uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you all for, uh, for joining us. Um, uh, for those who I, I do not know or those who are online, my name is Sandra Galea, and I have the great privilege of serving as Dean of the School of Public Health at Boston University. And welcome to this uh, symposium on nursing and the health of populations. This is uh, organized by us at the School of Public Health in partnership with uh, Nursing Now and the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. These uh, symposia are events that we do roughly quarterly on uh, issues that we think are of real consequence for the health of populations. And uh, this uh, event uh, really emerged as a partnership with the Institute for Healthcare Improvement and uh, Nursing Now, focusing on something that we think is really, we, we do not pay anywhere near as much attention to, which is really the role of nursing in uh, generating population health and the intersections between nursing and population health. And we think we have an outstanding lineup for you today um, uh, to discuss this. And we've structured this in a, in a way that um, we can actually have some exposition, some uh, presentation of data and fact, and then have a panel which will be interactive uh, and uh, both in among the panel itself as well as with the audience. And uh, really, my role here is simply to introduce and to introduce the intellectual architect of this, who is Maureen Bisignano. Um, uh, very briefly, Maureen is the President Emerita and Senior Fellow of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. Um, she previously served as IHI's President and CEO for about five years, and before that she had served as the Executive Vice President and COO for about 15 years. She is a world-recognized authority on improving healthcare systems, and uh, her expertise has been recognized by having membership and election to all the right clubs, including membership in National, in National Academy of Medicine. She advises healthcare leaders around the world, is a frequent uh, um, uh, speaker in m many different places. Um, um, and uh, she's had a, a sort of a whole list of uh, prior appointments, including um, um, uh, before serving as IHI, she served as CEO of the Massachusetts Respiratory Hospital and Senior Vice President of the Juran Institute. But perhaps most importantly, um, uh, she's a graduate of uh, the School of Nursing um, uh, at Boston University in 1982. Um, uh, and as you'll see, uh, as, as you'll see, we have a number of our speakers who, uh, who uh, have graduated from our, uh, from our School of Nursing. Um, um, the, um, this event really emerged from conversations with uh, Maureen uh, about a year ago, and uh, really where we started talking and saying there, there are so many intersections between the goals of nursing and the goals of population health science and public health practice that uh, it is time to bring people together to have that conversation, and this is that conversation. Thank you all for joining us, and really I'm turning this over to Maureen now. Maureen. Thanks, Sandro, and I'm so happy to see that there aren't enough chairs. I mean, it's a great sign, I think, that we've got um, interest in this topic. And as I've been talking to a number of you uh, as we're preparing, what I'm hearing is that there's a great interest right now in thinking about nursing in a different way. You'll hear from Bob Stilwell in a few minutes um, to really help us to understand the impact that nursing can have on the triple aim of better health, better care, and lower cost. And I don't think we've been universally recognized for the impact that we can and will have on all three of those aspects of the triple aim. I wanted to do a quick introduction. Matt, okay. My skills. My heart. My voice. My brain. I'm all in. Tell me what scares you. Tell me your name. Because if scrimmage brings him here, I'm not playing games. Because each test tells a tale, and blood's an open book. We can change the story if we take a closer look. Because she escapes fracture, and a black eye will heal, that's not a cure for how frightened she feels. Because you can't change the rules by sitting on your hands. Sidelines have never been where I stand. I turn data to breakthroughs. I chart a new course. When there's earthquake or outbreak, I fly to the source. Aid giver. App maker. Risk taker. Crossing borders. Voice of comfort. Voice of order. This is the new script. No time to rehearse. So step up. We got this. Because I am. I am. I am. I am. Because I am a nurse.
and I am a nurse. So as I mentioned, the triple aim is critical. We uh, invented this at IHI some years ago to help people to understand that as a healthcare provider, we need to provide care, but we also need to prevent illness. We need to focus on the health of our population and that we need to work on cost. And as we traveled around the country, we found that there weren't many leaders who felt like all three of those areas belonged to them. And so we put that black dot in the middle and said, we need integration. And that's the challenge that I, um, that I bring to you today. Um, just a few examples of nurses who are totally transforming healthcare in their systems and their world. This is Jen Rogers, who some years ago took up a challenge when I read an article and challenged some uh, 4,000 people in France. I said, when you go back, don't just ask the next patient what's the matter. Also ask what matters to you. And she did that and has transformed healthcare not only in her hospital, but it's now spread across Scotland. And this year, on June 6th, will be the fourth What Matters to You Day with 35 countries, 2,000 organizations, everybody asking what matters to you. Nurses are the best people to do that because we're able to see across a patient's assets and families and challenges and social circumstances. Um, where did we go? <laughs> um, so you can see the spread from this one nurse who took up a challenge I gave her to spread this globally now. And it's just amazing to see the population health impact of asking that question. It's not just clinical, but most oftentimes the conversations are around the population circumstances. And it's leading to different ways to think and treat people. Um, this is a, a, a slide from Sweden, a young man and a nurse who created a totally new way to do dialysis. And when they created this new way to do dialysis, they found a patient-centered building in an academic medical center where the patients who do all their own dialysis procedures but also have social support from other people who are doing it are producing better clinical outcomes. They're, most all of them are working. They've got better lives and at half the cost of a traditional dialysis um, center. Started by one nurse. And at, right here at Boston Medical Center, um, I sat in on a nurse midwife's new program to do uh, patient-centered care, the centering model for pregnancy. And I was amazed when I followed a young woman through the model to find out that her care Went in her own hands with a group of about 10 other women in the same phase of pregnancy was producing confidence in her when she didn't have it before. It was producing social supports and addressing some population health challenges that would likely not have been addressed in a typical <coughs> clinical setting. So she, what you see in the centering pregnancy model is better clinical outcomes, decreases in preterm births, um, higher rates of breastfeeding, after six months and at a lower cost. And Sarah Zanton, a nurse practitioner from Johns Hopkins, started the project called Capable. Uh, she's a home nurse who was out in the field taking care of people, and when she walked into people's homes with her bag and did the meds and the, the um, diagnostics, she would then look up and say, wow, I don't know that my clinical care is gonna help this circumstance. So she created a multidisciplinary team of a nurse, an occupational therapist, and a handyman. And the handyman is actually having the greatest impact on keeping elderly safe and comfortable at home. So for an investment of $3,000, it's tripled the payback in decreasing hospital visits, em emergency room visits, doctor's office visits, increasing joy in work, um, for, for especially the handymen. They're now the faculty teaching the other handymen how do you uh, do the kind of things that keep people safe at home. But it's improving the well-being and decreasing social isolation for people elderly who are living at home. And finally, um, a nurse from the Netherlands who was frustrated with the way care was being delivered, and he started a new model of care he named Bertzog, which is neighborhood care. And neighborhood care means teams of nurses get together every morning 
and they know everybody in that neighborhood. They know the families, they know the patients, um, they spend time on the social determinants as well as the clinical needs. And this Bertzog model is producing better health, highest patient satisfaction, highest uh, improvements in population health, and saving the Netherlands about two billion euros a year. And so all of this comes from nurses who said, we can do better if we think about things in a different way. And I think when we get these stories out, it will help people to appreciate the gifts and the assets that we bring. So a few years ago, I met with Lord Nigel Crisp, a friend of mine from, um, from the UK, and he had just recently done a study on, um, on nursing and looked at the strengths and the, and the assets that we bring that are so under-recognized in almost every single country around the world. So we decided to come together and create a new campaign called Nursing Now, and I'm pleased to introduce you to Bob Stilwell, who's the executive director of Nursing Now. She's got a long and an amazing history. You've got her bio in your book. We've become friends as we've launched Nursing Now around the world. But the, the one thing is she's probably one of the only people I know who has a Wikipedia page named after her because she introduced nurse practitioners to the UK. And that's what she's most famous for until now. Now she's going to be famous for launching Nursing Now and for helping all of us to understand the gaps that we can close and when we do that, the impact that nursing can have on population health. So Bob, come and join me. Okay, super, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's great to be here, and uh, obviously among friends, more than one friend here. Um, how many of you are nurses? Oh, dear Lord. So, <laughs> and this, right off the bat, is one of our problems, isn't it? We all know that we are great. We all know we're creative. We know we can solve problems. We know we bring something new every time we sit around the table, a multidisciplinary table. But the problem is we tell ourselves that and we don't tell other people. So I want to talk to you a little bit now, in fact, quite a lot really, um, about how we enable health, the health, the nursing workforce to deliver healthcare with impact and to become more public about it. So that we're getting, you know, we're getting the recognition, the status, the profile that we all know that we deserve to have around the world. And just as Maureen has, I'm going to share with you some stories, some global stories about what nurses do. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit as well about um, why I think, what the challenges are. And some of this is my own uh, viewpoint, but obviously I wouldn't be doing this job um, if I didn't have some views about it. So um, I'm going to share some of that with you. But first of all, just to say to Dean Galeo, thank you so much for inviting me um, and bringing me here. It's such an honor to be here at Boston University. Um, I do have a cousin, my, one of my first cousins is a professor here, uh, a professor in physics. And until you invited me here, he's always thought I was just a nurse. But now, <laughs> he's looking at me with new eyes. So thank you so much. It is a great honor to be invited and to be with you all. So what I'm going to talk a, bit, a little bit about to sort of encapsulate it is why nursing and why now? Because those are two important questions about nursing now. Maureen has started us on the journey to, to consider why this has taken off now and why, what nursing offers and what the challenges are, as I said. I'm going to talk a bit about nursing and global health um, and take it into some of the low-income settings where we also work and have support and some of the results that nursing now is looking for over our short campaign, we end in 2020, 
So Lord Crisp, who Maureen has already mentioned, is my boss. And um, he said to me the other day, there's only 3,574 days left, Barbara. I was like, holy cow, I never thought that. So I'm waiting to go back and tell me how many minutes I've got to actually achieve this. <laughs> So nursing now is a global movement. We have, and I updated this this morning because it's changing so rapidly, 192 nursing now groups in 81 countries and 10,000 followers on Twitter. Um, and that has happened in the space of a year. So last August, we were in 30 countries and we had under 100 groups. Now, in whatever month we're now in, April 2019, that has almost tripled. So this is the first around the world that nurses have to be under the spotlight. This is what nurses are wanting. I mean, and this has taken us by surprise, to be fair. Um, we are blown away by the support that we have. By 2020, we really want to be influencing key policy makers. Um, WHO and the ICN, the International Council of Nurses, are our partners in this. We have some great champions. You can see them on our website. And through them and through the work we do, we really want to be influencing um, other or, or policy makers and people concerned with UHC and non-communicable diseases so that part of the narrative, part of the dialogue is about what nurses can do to contribute towards universal health coverage. And to do this, we want to develop nursing leadership. Now, we know that around the world there is so much nursing leadership going on, nursing leadership training and programs. But if you look at the impact it has, it tends to be short-lived. And what we want to look at is how we can support the development of nursing leadership in such a way that it changes the story of nursing. It changes what we're all doing in the way that Maureen has already begun to talk about. We want to make sure that we share effective practice between ourselves but more broadly, so that our non-nursing colleagues know what we're doing. They know the wonderful research that nurses do, the impact that nursing has, and they can talk about it as well. That's what we would really like to disseminate our effective practice very widely. And we want to invest, we want to get policymakers to invest in all aspects of nursing and midwifery. I should add and midwifery, and I'm, you know, it, it also, it always sounds very bad to say and midwifery, but we have realized that for midwives, there's, although they actually have been somewhat better um, at disseminating some of their work, um, they want to come along with this too. And so we're broadening our base to say, you know, how can we effectively do that? How can we be inclusive? And one of my philosophies when I took this job was that I wanted a big tent. I wanted a big tent so everybody could come in rather than being exclusive. So that's what we're working towards. I also have a triple impact. <laughs> um, I bet Maureen influenced Nigel, didn't you, when they were doing this? So this is how nursing now came about. As Maureen said, Lord Nigel Crisp, who used to be head of the British Health Service, um, and when he retired, he became very interested in global health. And he, perhaps, perhaps encouraged by Maureen, decided that the all-party parliamentary group on health should look at the, the impact of nursing globally. And that's what they did. And they collected evidence from around the world. Um, they looked at studies. They interviewed key nursing leaders. And this is what they found. Nursing has a triple impact. It improves people's health, and Maureen gave already some examples of that, and I will too. It results in healthier people, and therefore, 
better economies, stronger economies. If your population's healthy, they're going to go to work and pay taxes and your economy is, I don't know what, I'm standing in a school of public health, I don't need to tell you this. Um, and then because nursing is predominantly a female profession, it results in greater gender equity around the world. So it has those major impacts on our population. We then did, or you can see Lord, Lord Nigel Crisp is one of the authors of this, we then did another study, and this was after I'd um, taken up my position, on, uh, and it was for the Wish Foundation, which is in Qatar, on the effect of nursing and midwifery and high quality universal health coverage. Now there are 20 million about nurses around the world and they are about half of the total health workforce globally, about 50%. So unless we support nurses and midwives to deliver healthcare and to be effective at ensuring that everybody everywhere has access to healthcare, we're not going to achieve universal health coverage by 2030. So it's critical. It's not just a nice thing to do. It's absolutely critical that we find ways to empower the largest part of the health workforce to deliver high quality care. All the evidence that we have points to that being possible because we have a lot of evidence about what nurses do, the unique contribution of nurses. And this is from the Triple Impact Report as well. We all know that nurses provide intimate hands-on care. That's, if you like, the heart, isn't it? It's the heart of nursing. People give us incredible access to their, to their bodies, to their hearts, to their minds. I mean, that's a real privilege, I think a real privilege of nursing. Hildegard Peplau, whom some of you may remember and was certainly very influential on my studies, said that at the heart of nursing, there's a relationship. The relationship with the person you're with at that time. If it's a person in distress, a patient, a person needing information, somebody who's come in who's who's otherwise well but worried. You know, it's that relationship that enables you to be able to pick out what you need and they need to be doing at that moment. It's a precious relationship. And I think it's greatly undervalued, and I'm going to go on and talk about that in a moment. So at the heart of this is a relationship. It's this ability to be intimate, in all kinds of ways with people that enables us to provide patient-centered humanitarian care. And I'm going to give you a few examples of that. But, you know, in WHO, they talk a lot about implementing patient-centered care. But it's been difficult for them to make the links between nursing and patient-centered care. And that's one of the things, I think, that nursing now can bring to this particular dialogue is the importance of the things that we all do, most of us in this room, um, to enable people to be at the heart of their own care. So that's very important. And then we bring professional knowledge, don't we? Um, and it can be, you know, the thing about nursing is it goes in all directions, community, intensive care, mental health, midwifery, OBGYN, pediatrics, you know, it's like there's a sort of heart and then there's all these pathways. But we have to, we travel these pathways with the heart of nursing intact. And yet one of the difficult things sometimes is to describe exactly what's going on with our professional knowledge. So I was talking about my cousin, who's a professor here at BU, professor of physics, 
And he reminded me when I was talking to him last night that um, when I was doing my PhD, one of the things I looked at was the nature of nursing knowledge. And somebody um, had written a, a previous um, dissertation in which she had compared um, uh, geographers, nurses, and physicists in, and the nature of their knowledge and how they talk to each other about what they knew. So it was about professional knowledge. And what she found was that the geographers and the nurses had very similar boundaries, which were very elastic. So nursing, you know, sort of, it, it expands to fill the gaps, doesn't it? So if there's, you know, if there's no nurse out in the boondocks with mosquitoes the size of helicopters and no water, you know, everybody says, everybody send a nurse. I know a nurse will go. And they go. And they, you know, take care of what's going on. So we kind of got these bendy edges in nursing. And geographers are the same. I don't know if anybody you know any geographers, but they do a whole raft of things. You know, they can do demography, they can do climate, they can do soil erosion, they do the shape of the land. You know, it's all, I was astonished, but it's all subsumed under geography. Now, I, can, I checked this out with my cousin last night, and he said, yes, it's, abs it's still absolutely true. Physicists, they know this. <laughs> That's what they know. It never moves. It kind of goes along the trail, but, you know, so if, if Jeff, my cousin, talks to another physicist in, uh, in Kampala, they can have a conversation that they both understand because this is all they talk about, these little bits here. So in some ways, it's a lot easier to communicate when you don't have bendy edges, isn't it? It's a lot easier to talk about what you do. And I think that this is what I've come to call adaptive nursing, the art and science of the possible. And, you know, we fill in gaps. We see opportunities to be creative, to do something different, to say, what if we did it this way? What if we did it that? We take on new tasks. Um, and we respond quickly, and I'm going to give you some examples of that, to health crises. Nurses step up. You know, when there were, do you, I don't know if you, I mean, I'm as old as the hills, so I remember very well when HIV AIDS was a huge and new crisis, and maybe some of you do too. Who was it who stepped up to provide care? Yeah. And I'm not talking about research, and we needed the research, and we needed you know, medical research, ID research, all of that, all of that. But if you looked at who was looking at after those, those early patients, who was hugging them, it was nurses. And nurses you know, consistently step up. But what we're not so good at is describing exactly what we're doing and why we're stepping up. Um, and I'm, you know, I was very mindful um, because I introduced the nurse practitioner program when I, I went back to England. I've been away from England for uh, 26 years. And so when I went back, um, my ex-students sort of uh, had a party for me and showed me, you know, where nurse practitioners were now practicing. And they were practicing at local grocery stores and you know, in sort of little places where people would go and they could see them and talk to them and women's groups and pubs and all of these places. Exactly what you would expect, you know, that they'd gone to people. They'd taken the care to people. And that's so important. Um, and it's being written up, but it's not being read by the right people. Now, we have a case study on our website, and I'm going to read you a bit of it, and I urge you to take a look. It's, um, it's a small uh, American NGO called Nursing for All, um, and they work chiefly in Liberia. So I was very struck by this case study because it's another interesting example, important example. So when, in August 2014, Ebola was... <coughs> Excuse me, Ebola was gathering momentum in Liberia. 
this little NGO um, was doing maternal and child health chiefly. Um, but the nurses, the nurse, the Liberian nurse leaders realized that there was a problem. And they decided to change their focus to Ebola-oriented programs. And one of the nurses, Sophie Reeves, she felt her neighbors would respond best to information provided by a non-clinician because of the fears of transmission. So she trained local young adults to go door to door and provide information about Ebola's management and treatment. She was a nurse. Another nurse leader, Clinton Zinto, thought information would best be disseminated in local churches and mosques. So he went over to 30 churches and mosques and provided hand washing stations and taught people to recognize the disease. And they delivered medications to homes um, and basically stepped up um, to provide care when nobody else would provide care. So they not only thought about the care, but they then created the models and moved away from what they were doing in order to provide the care. And, you know, that's that sort of um, creativity and ability uh, is so sorely needed where there are outbreaks and changing care and so often un recognized. So I'm going to go through a bit about this <coughs> partnership, if my voice will last, and patient-centered care should never do long-haul flights before you give a talk. <coughs> so this is a bit about partnerships that I was talking about before and the centrality of relationships with patients. Um, Nurses have always developed partnerships and always made that the center of what they do. We walk alongside people, not cut off in front of them, don't we? To plan care and we plan care with people. This is a photograph from Kenya taken in uh, 2009. This nurse is called Ronica Onyango and she's with a patient whose name is Juman Joseph. He's 21 years old and he has malaria and he's been to other clinics um, but they treated him without testing first so his mother told him to go to this hospital um, and it was a dispensary but now thanks to the work that Monica's done with her team it's now expanded and it has 68 staff and 23 beds um, and provides you know to the community good care. So it has a reputation for providing good care. And I love this picture because you can see how they're relating together, can't you? Um, you know, she's, she's looking at him and he's obviously a bit embarrassed he's come to this clinic. Um, but it's a wonderful example of partnership and how this woman um, really, it was part of a, a project I was involved in uh, peripherally, so I know about this project, but it transformed care in this area, transformed it. This was taken in um, South Sudan, where I did work for a couple of years. And this nurse is Betty Ajiko Buku, is her name. And she is giving a sex education class to women in one of the health centers in Ye. Um, and before, what they did was, they said to the women, before we give you a checkup, we want you to come to this education class. And of course, it's designed to prevent unwanted pregnancy, to uh, prevent sexually transmitted diseases, transmissions of HIV, which was, you know, a big problem. Um, and it's a great uh, picture of this nurse who's clearly really into her role as, as health educator, isn't she? And it reminded me that um, in England, we have a, um, a doctor called Ma Sir Michael Marmot, who uh, works a lot on the um, social determinants of health. And he's written a great 
you know, big role about uh, um, how you work in public health to, prov to act on the social determinants. But the role was written for doctors. And it's interesting that nursing now, Northern Ireland, has got Sir Michael Marmot to say he will revise that with them, so it's for nurses. Yay. <laughs> and this young man is at uh, Mount Elgin district of um, Kenya. And he's, it, uh, it's interesting because this is a nurse. And he's meeting with a mother and child. And, I've, you know, I, I've, it's a beautiful picture. It sort of says everything about the way that uh, he's interacting with them. Um, and these were, you know, these were the stories and pictures that we had from around the world. And they're impressive, aren't they? And as well as that, you know, we had tons of evidence it weighed thousands of kilos, this evidence. We, you know, it's indisputable what nurses do and how effective they are and how they do it. And what, so the all-party party parliamentary group said, having looked at all this evidence, that what we need to do is to raise the profile and status of nurses, enable them to work to their full potential. We cannot have a cost-effective workforce unless everybody in it works to the top of their license. And that includes nurses. It in it's all of us. But what we need to do is enable each other to be working to the top of our license, to our full potential. And to do that, we need the support of politicians and policymakers and all of our colleagues. So, you know, we, we have to go along with them um, and we have to have them to support us, particularly policymakers. And why should they? Well, here's a simple reason. The health workforce is a best buy in sustainable development for all those reasons that I've been talking about. It's a three times return on an investment that you make in the health workforce economic growth, social development, and health and human security. And part of the health and human security is because nurses are there when outbreaks occur, like Ebola, and are able to respond, and are able to contain, and are able to notify. And those are really important elements. The High Level Commission on Health, Employment, and Economic Growth, which is a great report, um, <clears throat> <clears throat> found the same thing and found that we are, as I said earlier, we are never going to achieve these SDGs unless we invest in the workforce. And they, in fact, recommend 40 million new jobs in health and the social sector by 2030. 40 million. And of those, 9 million should be nurses. It's 40 million overall of everything. Also recommending maximizing women's economic um, empowerment and participation. And what did we find in the triple impact of nursing? It impacts gender equality, doesn't it? The equality of women, women's participation in the workforce. And the workforce needs transforming. It needs transforming in a way that stops professional protectionism, enables us to work together as a team um, rather than all of us in our own corners, you know, battling it out for supremacy by the side of the patient. And I remember when I was introducing the nurse practitioner role, a patient said to me once, if, you, if the doctor and the nurse are playing on two different teams, what does that make the patient? The football. And I thought, that is a wise, wise, that's wise, isn't it? Um, so how do we work, how do we transform the health workforce so that we think of ourselves as one workforce that can work together? Um, and that's more difficult in some places than it is um, in others. So our challenges, I think, are these at the moment. Challenges both for us and for the world 
there is this demand for a huge expansion in the health workforce, but we have challenges with recruiting and retaining health workers. And you know what? It's not surprising. It's really not surprising. My granddaughter qualified as a nurse last year. She's working at Great Ormond Street in London. She works 12-hour shifts. She gets paid less than a train driver. And she has to commute because she can't afford to live in London. She has to commute for two hours at each end of the day. So that's a 16-hour day. She barely has time to call her boyfriend. She loves her job, but you know, she's not going to stay in that job. She's already saying, you know what, I think I'm going to go to Australia and work there because they're advertising for nurses, you know? Um, so she has a first class honours degree from Leeds. She's clever. And she chose nursing. I don't know why. I certainly would not have encouraged her. But she did. <laughs> I mean, come on, it's hard work, isn't it? It's hard work. But she chose it. And, I, you know, thrilling that she chose it. But we need to pay attention to that. We know in England that nurses are staying only 10 years and then they're leaving after training. We only get 10 years of their work life. And they leave because of pay, conditions, morale. That's why they leave. And, you know, we've just done a survey for nursing now of nurses around the world. Um, and I can tell you this is true from Azerbaijan to Zambia. It's the same thing. Um, and it's not only nurses, of course. There are you know, many low-paid occupations, like teachers, that share some of this with us. But we need to pay attention to this. What can we do that will change this narrative? Work roles are changing. The workforce needs remodeling, as I said. There's a carequake. There's all these people who are going to live to be 102. They say the baby has been born who will live to be 200 years old. What on earth are we going to do about this? <laughs> you know, it's a, I think myself, when I get to be 90, I thank God my granddaughter chose to do nursing because she's going to be able to look after me. But, you know... Who is going to be there? And this is something we need to think about. Who's going to be there for all of us as we age? And, you know, the young population that was sort of um, at the bottom of the pyramid, the pyramid's going to start changing shape. What are we going to do about that? Who's going to deliver all those babies? There's also, and there's been a report published within the last um, couple of weeks, uh, was it? No, it was at the end of last year from um, WHO about the financial shift in investment to community care, primary care, away from secondary care, which is great, which is exactly what we want. But the same report found that GDP was, was uh, falling while investment in health was rising. And we can't afford it. How can we get afford it? You know, it's a, everywhere it's a serious serious question and we have to think about how we're going to rearrange the deck chairs so that everybody has health care and that's you know i'm in america need i say more <laughs> <laughs> so you know we now have dr google don't we um, <laughs> and all of us have access to dr google so when patients come in to see us now, they often know what's exactly wrong with them and what they need to have as treatment. Um, my own husband is exactly like this. He spends hours on the computer diagnosing himself. And the fact that I'm a nurse practitioner has no sway whatsoever <laughs> on what happens. Um, but we need to find ways to engage people with us on this health journey to enable health literacy so that when you use Google and you look at those things, they have meaning for you instead of terrifying you out of your mind. So we need to think about how we do that and how we engage with people who won't use any other way of getting health information. And it's estimated that around the world there are still a billion people who will never see a health worker. 
in their lives. So what are we going to do about that? Do we care? You know, this is something I think if we're talking about universal health coverage, it means everybody everywhere. It doesn't mean 80% of us. So we need to think very hard about how we do that. And then we need to find out what works best. We need to be disseminating all of these messages, um, you know, so that everybody does know. We can build on what knowledge we all have so that we can take some shortcuts. We don't all have to go along the same painful journey to discover something that somebody else has already discovered. So we need to find better ways of doing that and sharing what works. What's interesting to me about policy levers is that we do have most of them in nursing. How do we change policies? How do we interact with politicians, policymakers? We have so much research evidence. We could build the Taj Mahal with it, you know, but we just don't get it out there in ways that people say, wow, that's interesting. I was saying that we had just done this study on nursing, a survey on nursing. We had over 3,500 respondents, 2,500 after we cleaned the data. It's huge. Um, great findings, really useful findings, but it's in a 116-page report. Even I was bored, and I was one of the designers of the research. So, you know, we have to think, how do we make this so engaging that people will say, I really want to read this? And we have to be much better at making those links. But we also have to understand change management, don't we? And I remember when I started working for WHO, I worked, um, I worked in uh, one country where it's the only time in my entire life I've been called to a health workforce emergency um, at the Ministry of Health because they had to put a budget in for staffing for the next year and they didn't know how to do it. So I went and I was helping them put this budget together and I said, um, so, you know, how, how, many staff do you, <laughs> how many staff do you want? And they said, don't know. So I said, well, don't you do staffing then every year? No, no, we just ask for the same number. So I said, well, you don't ask for any more every year. And the guy said, no, no, we just, <laughs> you know, we're, we don't think about asking for any more. I was like, seriously? So, you know, we had a real good sit down, which took most of the night, and we created a plan which asked for more. And it's that lack of understanding of the policy cycle. You know, you have to know when are the budgets going in and how do I get into the budget? So those are very important. And political acumen. We have to know what's going on politically. We have to read the paper. We have to know when, you know, what the constraints are. All of these things. And nurses actually don't do that. Mostly it's because we're exhausted. Because we've been working 12 hours and, you know, who has time? But we need to be giving somebody the sort of mantle of political acumen so that we become much, much better at working with our non-nursing friends. And so I just want to say a final word about gender. Nursing is a gendered occupation. It is mostly women. Around the world, about 85% women. There are some men. And what we bring with us is this image of the nurse, the la nightingale and the lamp, don't we? That's what we bring, the lady and the lamp, like this. This is how it has played out in England. Um, this was a, a, an early call for nursing, the greatest mother in the world. And we wonder why there are not more men in nursing. <laughs> The best nurses have the essential qualifications before they go to school. No, they don't. <laughs> they certainly do not. <laughs> and look at the picture. Where's the guy? You know? So you get what you set yourself up to get, don't you? And, you know, this was actually an advert from the 70s from the Department of Health in England. And what about this? 2011 in China. Um, you know, we are blessed for whatever reason with these ancient images 
that still haunt us. I wish it had been a bloke in this picture, rippling his six-pack. I think <laughs> that would have been much better. However, we know it wasn't. So where do we go with this? Well, this is one of the places I think we go. How many of you knew that Florence Nightingale was the first female member of the Royal Society of, St the Royal Society of Statistics? good. Don't forget, everybody, this woman was a troublemaker. <laughs> she truly was. She didn't just go and carry a lamp around the Crimea. She counted what was going on. She met, co collected statistics. She brought them back to England and she showed them to politicians. She used her good influential connections with people in England to be really disruptive. And that's what Nursing Now is encouraging you all to do. We want disruption to this very comfortable thing we've got going on about being mothers and sexy nurses. We don't want that anymore. We want to get nurses on this continuum, collecting data, which we do, but then using it for dialogue with people who are not nurses, particularly with everybody, but particularly with politicians, policymakers, people who aren't nurses, and influencing decisions. That's what we're calling for. Get on that data dialogue decision-making um, continuum. And I'm delighted to say that the World Health Organization in 2020, because of um, the pressure that we and our, all of our groups around the world have begun to bring are doing for the first time ever the State of the World's Nursing Report, which will be republished in 2020, Florence Nightingale's Bicentenary, which is it's great news for us because this is data that we will be able to use as nurses for advocacy. What we want to see, more nurse-led services, so nurses being the leaders in forming teams, in designing care, in delivering care. Nurses out being acknowledged for the great work that's going on in primary and community care and in midwifery and child health and adolescent services, which will become ever more important as the decades roll on in this century. And as I've mentioned before, health, pre health promotion, prevention of illness, and health literacy. So helping people understand all of the information that's out there and working with them. And by doing these things, this is how we become a best, this is how we are a best buy in, uh, in sustainable development goals. And to do this, we need an enabling environment. And this is where the gaps are. We need legislation and regulation to enable us to be the kind of leaders we can be and a comprehensive workforce strategy. And I do believe that the state of the world's nursing will give us evidence upon which we can base workforce planning. And most of all, we need to raise the status and profile of nurses to be recognized, not because we're saying nurses are wonderful. We know they're wonderful. And if you ask anybody, they always say they're wonderful. It's like motherhood and apple pie. We go with them. You know, yes, nurses are wonderful. But we're more than wonderful. We're clever. We can do things. We get results. You know, look at the research we have. That's what we have to promote and get people to invest in our mastery of our profession so we really work to the top of our license. So I bring you greetings from the nurses of Barcelona who are saying nursing now. I was at, that was the last launch I was at, and I thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Barb. And we will all have all the speakers uh, gather at the reception so that you can ask questions. But I think that the charge that I hear from Barb is that we've got lots of knowledge and we've got to get out there and let people know the kind of changes that we're making. Um, we do tend to be a little bit self-effacing, a little bit shy, 
And I do think that uh, what you're going to learn now from the five panelists is that the very special skills that we bring to our profession need to be shared very broadly so that we can have everybody appreciate the skills that we bring. So I'm going to ask our five panelists to come and join me on the stage. And we've got a great uh, overview looking at um, education, at leadership and development, at the role of technology, serious illness, and the scope of practice. And I'm going to invite these five uh, nurses to come up and join me. We'll go through and have a little bit of a conversation. And I'd love for you to be thinking about questions that you raise so that we can start to have a conversation about raising the profile of nursing. So come join. And Matt, can we pull this? is that we perhaps need to think about our role as leaders uh, in a different way. That understand what our contributions are. And I think five brief presentations is that we're contributing in many different ways. Leadership and looking at data, really the research that Bob was talking about. As Barb has said, we've got a big gap to fill. Even in the United States, as you probably all know, we've got about 3.5 million today, and we need a million more by 2024. Experience, the only profession that I can find, other than perhaps actually challenging and And so, as leaders, we need to step up and say, how can we nurture the knowledge and how can we uh, help with compassion the people? The optimistic, because um, as I've been interviewing and doing some research, finding 93% of new nurses say that they have no intention of being in the same job for more than one to two years. So we've got a lot of work to do as nursing in a different way. Education and how do we begin to bring nurses in in a different way. Another, uh, she's going to uh, share with us some thoughts that she's got. Do feel free to be thinking about questions and we'll either get them done during the panel Do you have Jackie's slides, Matt? There we go. Okay, here. So, um, I just like to acknowledge yeah, that portions. The mic? Oh. Like to acknowledge that portions of this presentation are from an article that I wrote um, with my colleague, um, Dr. Carol Ellenbecker, uh, and we published in Nursing Outlook in um, 2015. The original uh, title of the conceptual model was the conceptual model of nursing for population health. Um, and population health. And I've changed it for this presentation to the conceptual model of nursology for population health and educational considerations because the proper name for nursing is nursology. And so nursing now should be nursology now. And you would be amazed what happens when you start referring to yourself as a nursologist and that the discipline is nursology, just like psychology and bi biology and all the other ologies. And people really, oh, really? And, and then there's, there's no discussion about it. It's quite amazing. <laughs> and we have a, a website called nurseology.net, um, which is the, on my pin, that Peggy Chin and I and a whole bunch of other people started. And um, we have weekly blogs, and it's all things theory in nursing. So next slide. Um, so this is the, an, um, the diagram of the conceptual model um, of nurseology for population health. Um, and 
the conceptual model addresses the intersection of nursology and population health. Um, nursology I've defined as knowledge of the phenomena of interest to nursologists, which are why, when, where, and how nursologists collaborate with other human beings as they experience wellness, illness, and disease within the context of their environments. Next slide. The didactic um, component of education emphasizes acquisition of philosophic, conceptual, and theoretical knowledge and empirical indicators. Empirical indicators, of course, are used to measure practical activities. The clinical and simulation component of education emphasizes acquisition of practical knowledge, including cognitive and motor skills. Environments are systems, structural, and social determinants of health. So socioeconomic environment is the circumstances of a population, including income, education, employment, social support, and culture. And the physical environment is the surroundings of the population, including the atmosphere of the earth, gaseous composition of air, solids and gaseous pollutants, smoke, weather conditions, geologic stability of the earth's crust, water, uh, urban and rural design and resources, housing, ultraviolet, radiation, bacteria, and viruses. Population factors are social determinants of health. Genetic factors are the inherited origins of a population. Behavioral factors are lifestyle variables of a population, such as smoking, alcohol consumption, substance abuse, physical activity, and diet. Physiologic factors are biologic variables of a population, such as vital signs, body mass index, and cholesterol, uh, and blood glucose levels. Resilience is the population's ability to bounce back or recover from adversity. And I would indicate here that, that when Carol and I were developing the model, um, we were talking about resilience, and um, Carol was saying, you know, like, that's really an individual characteristic. And I, and I thought of, uh, there must have been something that was recently in the news about a, a community being um, hit by a tornado or a terrible storm or a flood or something. And I said, but these communities are bouncing back. They're resilient. And so we decided that resilience could be a population factor. And then health status is a state of the population that is characterized by soundness or wholeness of developed human structures and of bodily and mental functioning. Healthcare system factors are system and structural determinants of health. Providers include nursologists and all other members of healthcare teams. As providers, nursologists may provide direct care for populations, teach students and other nursologists, and or conduct and report results of studies of phenomena of interest to the discipline of nursology. Relevant healthcare system organizations and institutions includes departments of public health, hospitals, inpatient and outpatient clinics, community health centers, and home health care agencies. Institutions, large and small, provide nurse nursological and medical services that serve populations experiencing acute disease conditions. Payers are insurance companies and other sources of reimbursement for health-related services, such as in this country, Medicare and Medicaid. And policies include plans for action that address equity of access to and utilization of health care by populations. And I think it's important to separate out access and utilization, because people can have access, but they don't necessarily utilize. And my husband has been actually one of the, the prime examples of that until recent years when he's had some health challenges. So he always has had very good access to care, but wouldn't utilize it. Heaven forbid he go to the doctor, they'd find out, or the physician, or find out something was wrong with him. Of course, he had a wife who was a nurse who, nursologist, who could tell him what was wrong with him. <laughs> So population health outcomes um, include wellness, disease burden, functional status, life expectancy, mortality, and quality of life. So population wellness is the population's collective level of growth, integration of experience, and meaningful connection with others, reflecting population valued goals and strengths and resulting in being well and living well and living values. Population disease burden is the incidence of and or prevalence of major chronic health conditions in a population. The total effect of a disease on the population. Population functional status is a population's optimal level of performance of usual 
uh, activities of daily living and instrumental activities of daily living. Population overall expected years of remaining life at any age. Population uh, mortality is years of potential life lost for a population, and population level quality of life is a population's physical well-being. Nurseologist activities are actions performed by nurseologists directed to collaboration and coordination. And I deliberately use multidisciplinary rather than interdisciplinary because um, I'm very concerned that inter interdisciplinary means that every discipline loses its boundaries. Really good thing. I think it's important that each discipline is very aware of what its distinctive contributions to the Nurseologist activities encompass provision of population-based practice processes as form various nurseological conceptual models and theories, including assessment, planning, intervention, evaluation, with special emphasis on data and the healthcare team coordination and collaboration. Culturally aware wellness promotion, restoration, and maintenance directed toward enhancing optimal level of population's collective growth, integration of experience, and meaningful connections with others, reflecting the population valued goals and strengths, and resulting in being well and living values. So we already know what population level nurseological activities are. So culturally where disease prevention is provision of disease practice processes directed toward avoiding objective and tangible clinical signs and symptoms of a health problem. So what does all this mean? Um, I think we need to go back a, a few. Because this we should be in year one. Semester one, okay. So this is, this is an example of how a curriculum can be formed using this conceptual model of nursing for population health. Um, and so, um, I think I have this a little backwards here. So in the first year, we would do, the first year of the first semester, and I'm, I set this up as a four-year, two-semester program that could be uh, for a baccalaureate program. Um, you could have more than one course um, in, in a semester and make it into a graduate course or make it a shorter, you know, like upper division um, baccalaureate program. So um, in the first year, in the first semester, we would look at environments, including the socioeconomic environment and the physical environment. In the second semester, next slide, um, we would look at population factors, so the genetic factors, behavioral factors, physiological factors, resilience, and health state. In the second year, in the first semester, we look at healthcare system factors, including providers, organizations, and institutions, payers, and policies. And then in the second semester of the second year, we could look at all of those population health outcomes. Then in the third year, um, we can look at nurseologist activities uh, including practice processes and the culturally aware wellness promotion, restoration, and maintenance. In the second semester, we could look at culturally aware disease prevention. In the fourth semester, we would link, in the, in the fourth year, in the first semester, we would link the nurseologist activities with population health outcomes. And in the second semester, we would link all of the conceptual model concepts. Um, and you could do the next slide that shows the diagram again. So I, I don't know whether this would actually work, but it seemed like it was a really good idea, and it's the way I would design a curriculum and uh, using a conceptual model to guide my activities. So the next slide, please. So teaching strategies um, focus teaching strategies focus on students' um, clinical thinking, clinical judgment, and clinical um, reasoning. And then the next slide. The major challenge. I think, is teaching students of nurseology to think populations because nursologists um, have traditionally thought, think, nurse, think individuals. And despite Florence Nightingale's emphasis on populations, we have focused a great deal on the patient as opposed to populations. 
And next slide. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jackie. I'm kind of, well, I'm practicing saying nurseology in my head, uh, but I'm blown away by the content that I never learned in, in my uh, educational process and how far nursing has come, I think, to think more broadly, as you say, to think about our skills as having an influence on, on health across the population. And it's really this way uh, at, at the population level as well as the individual level. So thank you for that. Do you think that this content can be adapted to shorter nursing degree programs and and will do you think we'll see a new specialty coming up? I just spread this out, you know, was just thinking about it, spreading it out, thinking about baccalaureate students. Yeah. But um, there's no reason in a, in a semester and therefore you would have like a two-year program. So you could do it in an accelerated program. And every course would have didactic content level it was. I, I love the idea of really getting out, doing simulation, getting out into the community. The most powerful learning for me has always been harvesting from the field. And I think that or, or, um, those kind of community experiences are the ones that I think are going to move us most. Thank you so much, Jackie. Well, thank you. So we're going to move on to talk about leadership. And I, at this point, I'm going to ask you to take Bob's advice and to, I think we're way too kind of uh, shy about uh, getting into our now is to get more nurses into CEO positions and on boards. And I'm finding incredible interest. I mean, no, five boards now. But every day I'm getting calls from people who want women and who want nurses to have that voice on the board. And I do remember day as a CEO, I was 34 years old. And I went to a meeting, and I was the only woman, and I was by a I walked into the room, all these men sitting around a table, and one of them turned around to <laughs> And I had to think at that moment, how do, I how do you take it? I'm happy to get you coffee, and this afternoon, you get me mine, and I take mine black. broke the ice, and I do think we need to see nurses in all of these positions. So, Karen, take And I have to say, I'd like to start by um, changing my accent to Barbara Stillwell's accent. <laughs> I mean, it's much Instead more entertaining <laughs> to listen to now, um, or mine. Um, you know, I have the opportunity to do a fair amount of speaking. I actually think my, um, my phone... I listen much more to Alexa or <laughs> when I hear it. So um, I think, you know, I, I don't have slides. Uh, you know, Maureen and Barbara have touched on important, really important pieces that to some extent I'm going to repeat and Jackie, you're conceptual model is a critical one for us moving forward. Um, this isn't nursing's first rodeo in terms of conceptualizing healthcare reform. Um, and I think it's important to talk about our legacy because that's part of what we should own as we move forward. The lady with the lamp is always at the beginning of the conversation. The fact that she used data to drive what became a two-thirds reduction in more And, and what that, what was involved in not only the data collection, but moving it through a policy body and getting the monies to, um, to have them embrace more sanitary conditions for those souls. Lillian Wald and her work in the late 1800s, 
um, at the Henry Street I isolated social conditions and, and really addressing the needs at that level of health in order to advance population health. Um, and she really was the person that, the, the, she was the, there was the genesis right there of, of Breckenridge, who was a nurse midwife in, in Kentucky in the Appalachian Mountains, who traveled as the first nurse to really outreach to rural populations and to really provide that level of delivery. Um, the first public health nurse actually in 1913. So this isn't new conversation for us. Um, school nurses, I don't think acknowledging <laughs> how important school is. Not only connecting with the health needs of children, but we're seeing evolving models within um, family needs dental, mental health, and really, really um, take and the skill sets of school nurses, what they bring to that that allows them to really contribute to the health of entire families. Um, and I have, um, Barbara was going to bring it up, but you know, I had the opportunity two years ago to be the closing keynote at the 30th anniversary. And one of the things that is, was clear to me, you know, at the very outset of the HIV epidemic, your offerings were so limited, it was the nurses that stepped up. And I have to say, not to their own um, peril, because they were with actively infected AIDS patient, but they brought them support and comfort and help them die a dignified death. And I can't imagine a better but I do. Because it's the dignity of what we of what we enable people to do along the continuum of their health and their life. That, that I think the um, nursing's leadership and its legacy emerges from our philosophy of care. And, I, you know, I didn't want us to not have a moment to think about what it is that we, as a profession, have a special place within the healthcare arena, too. And it's the fact that we, as a that it's the entire patient. It's not just the physical needs. It's the, it's the emotional needs. It's the social needs. It's all those needs across the continuum that contribute not only to individual, but also population health. President Lyndon Johnson signed and celebrated um, the passage of Medicare, that the American Nurses Association that supported that, the, that um, Medicare passage. Um, but it, it also reflects, I think, our ability to look beyond kind of the day-to-day -day struggles and really understand it a, in a broader way what's important in terms of people's health. Another document that was really critical, in 1991, the health care, there was a nursing blueprint for health care reform that was endorsed by over 60 nursing organ national nursing organizations. nursing community and beyond because it was a document that was utilized within the policy arenas but for articulating what is now pretty much the triple aim uh, it had although the the framework the blueprint from the nursing um, profession really talked about lower cost it had a fourth leg and that was workforce so a, a critical piece of that, nursing recognized it early on, is not only do you make sure that the other three are addressed, but a part of this is making sure you have adequate numbers of well-educated nurses. I think the IOM report, I became president of ANA, and I, two big 
I became ANA president in June. In November, I watched as the IOM report on nursing rolled out. And that report has had, has had a staying power and a, 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 I think uh, has been a rallying cry, a call to action for the entire advancing basic nursing education. And, and in terms of leadership, recognizing that leaders I wouldn't say every nurse is a leader, and I'm, that might be a controversial thing. Are when they are when they are skilled and competent, and able to use their voice and advocate in terms of an individual patient's life, but also in terms of the healthcare delivery system, and the the fact that the the report recognized that it's it's critically important as we talk about things. nurses as leaders within healthcare teams. And, and, you know, we need to move away from this captain of the ship concept. You know, other disciplines have adopted and, and seem, we get so embroiled in these turf bags. It reduces the effectiveness of care. And nurses are able, competent, capable leaders that should be at the forefront of many um, of many aspects of healthcare team delivery. Population health, I was thinking of a story while Barbara was speaking, and, and it's a story that emergency department in New York that was waiting for victims from the, um, from the tower, the, the two towers that had fallen. And um, so there were physicians and nurses out there with stretchers and waiting. And from, from uh, one of the towers. And the physician said, and one of the people outside, I think probably one of the reporters said, why are you still out here? There's not any survivors. They, and, and I think that speaks very much to our philosophy and, and, the, and the way we look at health and, and assuring that we address in a holistic way the needs of populations. Um, I just want to talk about government for a minute. And it's, uh, I have to say, with what's happening in Washington, um, it's not very encouraging. It's not very productive. It's very partisan. Um, it doesn't really get at the core values of, of population health or health care delivery. Um, I do think there are things that are regulatory agencies like CMS, where they can have some impact in terms of cost. That was largely based on the Affordable Care Act and um, part of that framework that, that came forward. Uh, the, uh, you know, the federal government, I don't think that's going to be where they're of value to us as a profession or, or to help feed the pipeline so that we can meet population health demands, um, help subsidize and fund research that's critically important. And we know a lot of our research is really based in behavior. So it's critically connected to what, what it is that's most important I think the, um, the, another thing, and I'm going to steal it from Rick, is um, he talks about the fact that um, it's not about moving people, because our healthcare system, delivery system, has really been a system. It's about moving knowledge moving knowledge out into the communities, into rural areas, so that um, I don't, I'm not even sure I, I agree it's a consumer process, but their care and their decision making in a way that's well informed. Um, I think the other that is important 
and I shouldn't have all these notes because I know has to be a central consideration in every bit of policy making. That when we're having conversations at the level of the it is the community and the local and the regional governments where we're going to make the But those decisions and those conversations are, are conversations that every nurse in this country can inform because we are relationship based. We do understand Because of our proximity and care of patients, of shifting care delivery um, away, really from acute care, where there's very little bang for our buck. We know about half of the variability around associated not with acute care, but really it's about behavioral kind of issues, lifestyle issues, social issues, our resources and, and, and you know, talk about being provocative, you know, the, the ideal would be to So I think that the last thing I'll just say in terms of leadership in government, um, you know, we're one in every hundred persons in this country. We're part of our community. We're respected by the people we care for. And that gives us an ability, I think, to have an impact far beyond. Said that, though, there's no healthcare delivery system that's going to function just with one profession versus another doing the work. It's got to be team based care delivery. It's organizational leadership. Beyond individual leaders within the healthcare arena, Organizations within the nursing profession serve a purpose. They amplify our voice. They give us better access to policy makers and they, they help us really consolidate. Um, so it becomes a really important piece for nurses. And I understand that nurses join other organizations, but if we don't have the time to do the work and get up to a state house or be, go to a local committee. Join your organization that will do the work for you and keep that voice alive so that those conversations. I think the, um, there's a few initiatives and I'll just close with these. Um, Maureen mentioned one and that is I sit on five boards. Um, it's important work. It's a, it's a conversation in a, in a lens through which many others in healthcare delivery don't see the world or see patient care or see population health. It's a really important is, is alive and well in nursing. Governance is a natural extension of that. So that we should be sitting on or a health board or a state legislature. We have um, Barbara Blakeney in Massachusetts was just appointed to the, the Health Policy Commission, which is a, a critical placement for us, the first nurse, but someone who's well informed and understands the, also the, the fine, particularly important pieces. Mary Wakefield, um, who was before the change in administrations was the um, Mary would not have gotten there without an appointment from the nursing community. So those kinds of, those kinds of things, and I, I know I'm probably beyond my time, but those are critical pieces for all of us to think about population health. So I'll stop there. From your comments is that you should run for office. <laughs> you? You. <laughs> um, we do need that voice at every level.
your comments about the importance of governance, leadership, and also moving uniquely uh, focused on the health needs of all and to marry up Jackie and University in Kentucky. I don't know if anybody's gone to visit, but an amazing place for uh, nurses, DNPs, uh, midwives, and the focus is on population with safe care, and I think that brings together the heart and the mind of, of nursing. Um, Kelly, Kelly Britton's going to talk to us about technology and um, how we might with population health. So join us, Kelly. Great. Um, good afternoon. It's wonderful to be here during Public Health Week and um, National Minority Health Month to talk about, you know, the relationship of future public health. In public health, we will expect many of the same issues to that we're coping with and dealing with now to exist in the future. Um, you know, of course, cancer, diabetes, high blood pressure, and also um, also taking into consideration that we'll have an aging population, and unfortunately, we are not moving the needle in terms of birth outcomes. So, in the future, we will be looking. addiction. Um, and we all know that public health resources are shrinking and technology can actually aid in our effort communities. And mobile health or M health as you may know it, um, in my mind, um, it has to me three distinct tiers. Um, one of which um, is the um, electronic data platforms. Um, the second tier um, includes the remote health monitoring devices, um, such as, you know, scales that wireless in healthcare agencies and provide that type of um, chronic disease management. Um, other types of remote health monitoring include wireless glucometers, um, as well And recently in Time Magazine, there was an article about Mabu. And these types of articles are conversational AI where they actually um, gather information and perform a decision tree. And then um, providers can then intervene. The computer has been automated to perform, um, you know, points in that direction. Um, another technology that Medicaid and Medicare currently pay for is telemedicine, you know, which is video cameras and conference area in terms of being able to obtain access for remote populations in terms of specialists and, and MRI readings and CAT scans. Apps, of course, um, but mobile apps to me is still an uncharted territory because um, of the lack of interactiveness with many mobile apps. Um, most apps food logs and step trackers, um, and that's not really health decision making. So in, in, in my research, um, I developed a mobile app with some researchers here at Boston University. The healthcare decision tree to make decisions regarding colorectal cancer screening. But I propose that more of us, more nurses and those of us in public health, need to be in the forefront and lead those teams along with engineers so that apps and that actually lead us to more meaningful health outcomes. Um, and the third tier of um, the technology is actually the phone itself. is actually probably the greatest tool um, in public health because we can actually create many things um, relatively conveniently and inexpensively. And I'll preface this by saying that I'm not promoting 
because we know that screen time has potential negative effects. But we can certainly make sure that public health has a footprint in harnessing the reach and the power of the phone to improve the health of populations. What about the phone and, and gaps in the internet um, use among Search Center reported that nine out of 10 Americans access the internet. And that breaks 90% of suburban populations and 78% of rural populations accessing the internet. And as we uh, consider the gap related to education, well, so about 65% of um, people with less than a high school education access the internet, and then among 84% of high school graduates access the internet. And of course, we expect that as education rises, internet Perhaps the biggest change in the last 10 plus years in um, internet um, is or more, um, most often we were using home, home broadband um, to access the internet. But now um, many Americans and many um, Americans of lower socioeconomic status um, access the internet via their smartphone. And um, the Four percent of all Americans have cell phones. So that breaks down to about 13 percent of Americans have the basic cell phone, which is only used to make calls. And about 81 percent of Americans have smartphones. Um, and this translates into have smartphones. So now we're decreasing that um, generation gap we thought we were going to have with smartphone usage. So with the smartphone, we are seeing that this is really breaking down many barriers, including um, internet access among diverse populations. 24% of blacks and 14% of whites report that the smartphone is the only way Come um, as well, about 31% of those with incomes less than 30,000 um, access the internet exclusively. Those access their um, internet with a smartphone. 39% um, of people with less than a high school education and 22% of high school graduates access the internet through their smartphone only. So um, again, the smartphone is data plans now are unlimited, and many plans are also have unlimited text messaging, and the speed of the internet on our phones um, is pretty comparable um, to what we um, experience in our home by more accessible. So with all of this good news and great news in the works, we in the public health um, must harness the power and the reach of the phone. People, 2030, here we come, right? <laughs> so many people think that the mobile app um, is not amenable, you know, to really a mobile app. Um, so, and, and to be honest, that is not Facebook, um, Instagram, uh, maybe uh, Snapchat, LinkedIn, um, or uh, Twitter, right? Most of us use with our, with our phones, and by we, I mean all of us, because even though we are healthcare professionals, we are also consumers, and just because some of us have RNs or advanced degrees, I want fun, infor uh, fun information, good, useful facts, and things that's readily available. Page for colorectal cancer awareness among women is because I don't have a family history of cancer, and I really wanted to make cancer awareness and risk reduction information um, usable for everyone. 
So what are we using our smartphones for? And how can we leverage that? So we are accessing our, and using our smartphones to go to the internet, to go to So 73% um, of adults um, go to um, YouTube, 68% of adults are using Facebook, and 35% of adults are using Instagram. So um, go figure, right? So when we look at um, how to do things that they've never done before, maybe like fix that toilet or other times they're looking to just pass time and other times they're 19% uh, they're actually deciding on a purchase. So, right? How are we not leveraging this, this vehicle, right? So, um, and on YouTube as health, public health professionals, it has more to do about what the health department does and the services. Um, but we should be strategizing um, and the departments of communication and arts, psychology, drama, engineering, creative studies, that we could actually not only put on our YouTube channels, but also share on our Facebook or Instagram pages if our institutions have them, which obviously the data shows that we should. And this is brochures and handouts that actually should already be residing on our website so that our consumers can just download this inf information um, at any time that they're ready to download. Publishing this content on the internet via YouTube is just the first step. It's an old step and sometimes behind where everybody else is. Um, but it is the necessary first step. The next step is actually going into predictive analytics every day. We see it when we go to YouTube and we are seeing a new video that's being recommended to us or Hulu or Netflix. Um, these platforms seek to keep us engaged. You know, so it's you know, funny videos pop up, more cute cat pics, or more recipes pop up on our feeds. And predictive analytics is a part of um, artificial intelligence. Um, so how could we harness this in public health? So imagine in our well baby, the baby and where they, uh, we're expecting them to head, um, we could actually um, use this data to using that YouTube video content that we created to actually help um, give support and provide clinic. And imagine being able to send content to a patient prior so that an actual shared decision-making conversation could occur. And what if our boil water alerts came us actually what to do? So why not do this through a patient portal or some sort of patient uh, personal health record? They're not native to us like our phones, like Facebook or YouTube. Um, our, the future also includes more chatbots. Think of Alexa or Google Assistant. And these computer programs, again, are another form of artificial intelligence, which the user has a conversation. And these um, automated um, communication decision trees create a personalized consumer experience. Department that we have a chat bot and a person can ask a frequently asked question or seek an often requested resource at any time. I quote the Centers for Disease Control with engaging in non-traditional partnerships among different sectors of the community, public health, industry, academia, healthcare, local government entities to achieve positive outcomes. The role as leaders, collaborators, advocates, we know our communities. 
We know who the leaders are. We are and as clinicians, we know evidence-based practice, the clinical so our new role is that of innovator, breathing new nursing and dentistry, et cetera. But we need to be inviting new partners like engineering and com arts and sciences to walk the development of how technology and public health will work in the future to improve population health. So I challenge each of you to think of a new way of integrating technology. Talk to your clients and hear what they have to say about using their smartphone, YouTube, and then find new partners, engineers, people in com arts, drama, and add to these longstanding collaborations and let's build the future of population health together. Thank you so much. Even though I'm old, I'm really excited by what you're saying. <laughs> and when you think about it, the average person with a chronic disease spends 5,000 waking hours taking care of them. We can't be optimizing the one 15-minute visit. We've got to... I love what you're saying about using other media that's much more daily accessed than the traditional record. So it's care at the website. We're heading on a journey to understand more about how nurses can lead in long-term care. I actually believe in public health and nursing, so I want everybody, you cannot say anything. <laughs> you cannot talk to your neighbor, you cannot say anything. Stretch. <laughs> Sit down. <laughs> <laughs> slide somewhere. <laughs> yes, no? Yeah. Okay. Now, right? <laughs> what? Can you see what those three are? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there we go. There we go. Let's get it on the other screen so I can see them too. All right. <laughs> As we start today, um, Number one, I want to congratulate the School of Public Health at Boston University for its increase in rankings. It's among the top 10. I think it's number eight now, and this is fantastic. Uh, having watched this school from afar for many, many, many years, you've had two really great deans, and they're to be congratulated. Um, I'm going to talk today about some scope of practice, about chronically ill, I'm not as concerned as other people on this panel about the blurring of professions. On any one day, I'm a nurse, I'm a public health educator, I'm a behavioral scientist, and I wear proudly all of those titles. And so we're going to kind of see what happened. Uh, here in this picture, you can see the old Evans Hospital building, which was where I did my work. And so we're going to go on a very, very quick 55-year journey. <laughs> Next slide, please. One of my classmates, uh, Patricia Taylor Barden, said to me when I was an undergraduate, for some, nursing is an end. For you, it means a means to an end. I had no idea what she meant, but she was right. She was a very wise woman. Next, please. Uh, my career has been very varied. Uh, I started out as a Peace Corps uh, public health nurse in Chile. I became the training director of a, an early community health center. I worked for the International Confederation of Midwives in London. I think, Barbara, maybe in my earlier life I, we've met. I'm not sure. Uh, I was the training director for the 27 Native American health centers in California. I then did an abrupt turn and did a doctoral in public health and have been a professor at, at the, school, the School of Nursing at Stanford. And, and presently, besides being Professor Emerita at Stanford, I'm a partner in a new startup. 
you know, I know I'm too old, but that's the way it goes. <laughs> All right, let's go on. Um, this is the afternoon of the triple aims, so I'll just remind you of them slightly and we'll just go on because I think you've probably heard enough about the triple aims already. The next slide, please. So how do health systems today meet the challenges of the triple aims? We all know this stuff, prevention, diagnosis, treatment, medications, monitoring, hospitals, long-term care. But there is something fundamentally that is missing. The next slide, please. We have to have informed, activated patients, families, and communities. I think these are the keys to the social determinants of health and to healthy populations. We heard a little bit earlier about the patient being used as a ball. I've had patients say to me, I don't want to be the center of the circle. I'm not interested in patient-centered care. That's where you kick me around like a ball. I want to be part of the team. And until we make patients part of the healthcare team, I don't think we can have population health. And my career has been centered for the last many years on making patients a part of the team. Next, please. I work in the field of self-management of chronic diseases and other conditions of older people. Self-management is defined as the task that individuals must undertake to live with one or more chronic condition. And these tasks, taking from another nurse, Julie Corbin, include the confidence to deal with the medical management, role management, and emotional management of their chronic diseases. And I will say that this particular painting, why this one? Because this is what our self-managers in Port Arthur, Australia, <coughs> and our Aboriginal community painted for me as the symbols of self-management for their community. Next, please. So why should we care about this stuff? People spend 95% of their time outside of the healthcare system. And what they do in this time <coughs> largely determines their health and also the cost of the system. Self-management prepares them to spend this 95% of the time in the, most, in the most helpful way possible. Next. I'm gonna talk about the programs which we developed at Stanford starting 40 years ago and continue to develop to this day. Our programs are six weeks, interactive, small groups, and they include social networking. They're done both in person and on the internet. I actually think that the social networking on the internet is probably the most important part of the program. I'm not gonna talk about the internet programs today, but if you want me to, I can as we meet a one-on-one. -on -one. They're built on self-efficacy theory coming from the field of health psychology or social psychology, the work of Dr. Albert Bandura. All workshops are facilitated by two trained peers. Yes, we have some nurses and other health professionals facilitating some of the workshops, but if we depended on health professionals to, to do these workshops, number one, we could never get to the communities we're getting to, and number two, we don't have the workforce. We want people to work at the top of their level of skills, and peers have those level of skills too. What they need is good training and good support. Each of our programs are face-to-face, -face, 10 to 15 participants, and they're offered in the communities where people live and work. Next, please. These are the programs that we have today. And by the way, they're here in Massachusetts. They're everywhere. If you wanna look on the Evidence-Based Leadership Council website, there's a nice interactive map and you too can find them. And they're free. Uh, chronic Disease Self-Management, which is a generic pe program because people usually have more than one chronic disease. Pain self-management, we're doing a lot of work with opioid tapering as well as with arthritis. Diabetes self-management, positive self-management for those with HIV, cancer thriving and surviving, and our newest program, Building Better Caregivers for Family and Friends Caregivers. Next. So the reason people kept me around at Stanford for the last many years is because they thought I was a scientist. 
Uh, we've done a lot of randomized trials. These tend to be big randomized trials. They run from as 300 people to as many as 1,200 people over one or two years. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with lots of statistics, but what this and the next slide will show you is the outcomes of these programs over time. People have better experience of care. They have improved communication with the healthcare professionals, improved adherence to medication regimes. As far as population health, they have improved self-rated health, which happens to be the best predictor we have of future health, improved depression, fatigue, disability, in general symptoms, uh, in diabetes, improved hemoglobin A1C, less social isolation. If we're talking about population health, we have to talk about social isolation. And we're seeing less social isolation and better improved role activity. And then how about that third piece? And can we go to the next slide, please? How about costs? Data from a number of studies have shown us that we generally get about a two for one return on investment. The programs cost around $400 a person to provide. The savings in healthcare dollars is about seven to $800, a little bit more. And these, by the way, are not something that we thought up last Sunday. They're data that comes from claims data by organizations such as Anthem. All right, so that's what I've been doing with my life. Let's go on to the next one, just so you can see a little bit what this all looks like. And we can just flip through these kind of fast. So here we are in Boston, next. San Diego, let me talk a little bit about San Diego. This is Jorge's garage in the barrio. Nurses don't get there very often, but peer leaders do. And this is one of our classes in Jorge's garage. Next, please. Beijing, next. Chile, rural Chile, place dear to my heart, and most recently in Palestine. So this kind of gives you an idea of what this stuff looks like on the ground. It makes it a lot more real for folks. Next, please. So what's happened in the 40 years? We've had nearly 200 studies. We've reached about a million people. We're working in 35 countries, approximately 15 languages. So we're getting there. We're getting there. I'm waiting for five million. <laughs> so the summary of all this is that good health care cannot happen without informed, activated patients and caregivers. And the scope of nursing practice is much further than any of us could imagine, even my classmate, Pat Taylor Barden. Thank you. Wow. Kate, I'm so inspired by reach, by breadth, by looking at new models of care. Uh, what you're talking about here is taking care of people and families in a s completely different way. And, and, and I love it. I was in Northern Ireland recently and I went to the recovery college. In, here in the United States, if you get diagnosed with a mental illness, you are likely on a waiting list to get to see a provider. As Kate said, they're they're not, we don't have enough for weeks or months. But there, if you get diagnosed with a mental illness, you're given a college cap. How to deal with intimate partner violence or how to um, do uh, resilience training. Or and you sign up for college courses and you go to college and all the college courses are taught by people with lived experience. And the, the, Flipping the balance of power and using technology is going to really give us the energy we need to improve population health. And so our final panelist today, Deb, is going to talk about the scope of practice. Thank you. Um, I don't know if you could tell by my face that brain popping all over the place. And in many ways, we're all on the same page because we recognize the issues that we need to, uh, to face. I love debate. Uh, so 
just a little bit. Uh, I am going to watch the clock on your behalf because I want to get into a Q&A with you. So here is how I'm going to step on your toes. Nursing, the importance of nursing. Um, we have not spoken about the power of nursing. And this statement to you that as nurses, we are not powerful. As nurses, we are a marginalized profession in terms of the needs of patients and populations are concerned. As a person who deals with diversity all of the time, the pattern of being marginalized is about being oppressed. You're not autonomous. You're not independent. There is another place that you need to report to that gives you permission for what you can do. That you are on the edges of what needs to be done in terms of making change. I will look forward to when it comes to this issue of raising the status and the profile to do that if we are a marginalized profession. My belief is that we need a national nursing movement. That's my aspiration. That's my vision of uh, how we as a that we're concerned about. And we've studied them for decades, right? Uh, health inequities, disparities, we need culturally competent care and we need to define that beyond having an interpreter when we need one. We need to understand it as a, as a discipline, we can have some effect on population health because we as a discipline are making that difference. We are steering that ship in terms of change. is that we need to have what we don't have at the present, at present, as far as I'm concerned. We don't have leverage. What will give us leverage in terms of making change? I submit to you that we need to have a stronger partnership with patients. If patients rally with us around what we need to do to make change that nursing needs in order to get the attention and the support that we need, to expand our, our um, scope. This buzz um, is um, something that impressed me when we were doing the best. I don't know what your experience was with that, but my experience with that was people who citizens ready to vote had no idea how to vote because they had no idea momentum, and we should have. We have an incredible infrastructure for being able to drive change. And here's the infrastructure that we have that we are not taking advantage of at its fullest. And that is created state action coalitions. There is a state action coalition in every single state in the United States. There are 50, at least 50. With all of the minority nursing organizations and men in nursing. So we have an infrastructure for we need to uh, decide is what action do we want to take in terms of population health. We need a national movement because we no need to be all working at the same time, moving in the same direction. Consumers are clients. We don't yet have that buzz and that voice, and that's what we need to work on. So when I think about uh, minority health, population health, I think about discipline. It's prime time for us as a discipline. I don't know that we're ready to take advantage of prime time. 
And I would love to hear your is your evidence for saying that we are or are not. The last thing I would say is um, in part um, the CARE Act. Are we all familiar with the CARE Act? That act enables us to focus our partnership and the ingredients and factors in terms of the uh, healthcare uh, is moving from the acute care setting, that caregivers are now doing what one article I read uh, is education uh, dispensing and uh, skin care and uh, monitors and, and you name it. Care at home is, and in that arena of care in terms of being based in the home, in terms of in terms of being physically present in the community, because one of the questions that I always, always ask myself is, how many minority nurses live in the zip code of our patients? With them in that community because of their familiarity, not only with the addresses of the people who live in those communities, but they're personally familiar with the And we need to take advantage of that in terms of lending our voice and our drive this next evolution of nursing is in our hands. We need to step up in terms of this message that I What do we mean by that? It's something that we need to explain. Take charge of our practice in terms of stop thinking about institutions where staff can deliver our expertise. We need to think about care in the community. the extent of our practice when it comes to nurse-run clinics, for example, where we are situated in the community, which makes it uh, easy their own health destiny. So um, if your toes are sore because of what I said, I am and A, so that we can figure out how we can get our voice into the public square and drive change ourselves. Imperative. What's the intervention and what's the effect of that intervention? As nurses, if we can articulate our work in that way, I think we can. Thank you, Deb. And I'm completely inspired by the challenge that you've laid out for us. It's so important, and that is every day, difference nurses have made, not only in their health care, but in their lives. I was recently interviewing a young man who had been. Um, a, with a handgun by his friend by accident, and he's been paralyzed for a while. And he's very articulate about the nursing, how nurses taught him to catheterize himself, and how PT and nurse, and how he drives his car, um, all handicapped uh, uh, capable. Did a nurse ever change your life? What was the meaning of nurse started to cry? And I said, tell me. And he said, it wasn't anything about the clinical. In the ICU for two weeks, and he said, the night uh, shift was about to come. When his doctor walked into the room and said, 
Gilbert, I realized, face it, this is it. You're never going to walk again. And Gilbert started to cry. His nurse who was there with him, she was just ready to go off her shift. I said, what did she do? Hands on my shoulders. And she put her head on my chest. And for two hours, she never moved. Shift with her head on his chest. And he said, she saved my life. He said, she saved my life because she cared that time that I could have hope and I could and he always goes back to that that nurse who put her head on his chest we don't tell those clinical side or the going into a community and understanding everybody's needs in a zip code or putting I take your challenge I take all of your challenges to say it's our job to get out there we do every single day to take care of people. Two hopeful moments. Um, the National Academy of Medicine is just launching a new nursing study, and many of you, I'm sure, will have been or will be invited to it last week, and I think it's going to have a different perspective. As important as the last one was, I think we'll have a And Nursing Now will launch next um, Tuesday in Washington, D.C., Nursing Now USA. So I encourage you to go on to the What can you do, and how do we join uh, Barbara in this global campaign to strengthen nursing? We've got a wonderful reception, and all of us will be there to have the Q&A that Deb challenged us to. We appreciate your, your time and your attention, and more than that, I appreciate what you will do to get the profession.